Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, we have a modest sized group today, so you should actually feel free to just jump in and ask questions as I go along, but um, I'm also happy to take questions at the end. As uh, Althero kindly said, I'm Ariel Ekbla. I'm the director and founder of this highly interdisciplinary flight opportunities program at MIT. We support graduate students all across the institute, whether they come from art uh, or biology or science or engineering. My own personal background, it was originally in physics. So I studied particle physics in undergrad and then kind of made a pivot to space engineering and space sciences and did my PhD in aerospace structures and self-assembly, robotic self-assembly. And now I lead this um, multidisciplinary lab at MIT. And towards the end of today's conversation, I'll actually tell you a little bit about a startup uh, for next generation space architecture for which we're recruiting students and would love to engage with many of you if you have ideas or ways that you think you might be interested in contributing. Just do a quick um, context setting here. I'm sure many of you are already familiar with these platforms, but we are at this incredible cusp of both interplanetary civilization, right? Thinking about human settlement on the moon and Mars within the next decade or two decades. And also this really burgeoning uh, level of activity in low earth orbit uh, and with microgravity research. Um, I don't have to explain to this community the zero G flights, affectionately known as the Vomit Comet, um, but we also made really great use in recent years of the Blue Origin platform, uh, New Shepard, and they're actually looking to, in the near future, be able to have these suborbital uh, experiments be human tended. And we're beginning to see this transition where it'll be not just zero G flights any longer, where you actually get to attend with your project as a you know, undergraduate or graduate student researcher, but actually suborbital, that opportunity is opening up. And we think within the next few years, there may even begin to be opportunities for um, undergraduates or graduate students on really core projects to actually go to the International Space Station. We're already in dialogue with some of the space tourism groups that are enabling this for guests, and we would love to see scientists and students be brought along in this. So just to say this, you know, uh, big news last summer around the human uh, flights for Blue Origin and also Virgin uh, Galactic's space plane. Moving a little further out in orbit, of course, we already have the International Space Station um, for which we've, you know, had, you know, many years now of an amazing microgravity research program coordinated through ISS National Lab cases um, and through some direct flight integrators who I know many of you know, BioServe, Space Tango, NanoRacks, et cetera, giving us a pathway to do research in orbit. However, I just wanted to highlight a few additional uh, space stations that have been proposed, again, pretty much within the last year or two years. So it's an incredible uh, rate of progress here that we see Axiom working towards their own uh, commercial space station. Blue Origin and Orbital Reef really working towards this vision of a business park in space, lots of different um, ways to utilize microgravity. And NanoRacks and Star Lab Oasis, I think in collaboration with um, Voyager and, and Lockheed, if I recall that correctly, are also thinking about you know, growing um, agriculture and these different types of platforms um, that could be uh, done in reused uh, spent fuel rocket stages. So there's really just about to be an absolute explosion of opportunities um, to get access to longer duration microgravity testing as these additional commercial space stations come online. I won't linger too far here because this is of course a gravity body, this is the moon, um, but we are really excited to announce that my group at MIT, we are leading MIT's to the moon to stay mission. And we are contracted on Eclipse mission to go back to the surface of the moon, um, hopefully by June, 2023, we'll see, um, the Intuitive Machines 2 mission. And so we're sending a tiny little swarm robot that I'll show in a moment and a depth field camera to take um, imagery of the lunar surface. And of course, as we all know, um, many groups, SpaceX among them, are thinking about the future of Mars, life on Mars. My vision, and I think why it fits this community so well in terms of thinking about microgravity, is that we really do need to focus on life in orbit, being able to build the next generation of space stations that are microgravity space stations, because you can, and we know how to do this, we just need to, like we know uh, in terms of laws of physics how to do this, we need to work on the engineering to enable artificial gravity and actually really being able to spin habitats. 
I think that there will be um, for decades some really major challenges to expanding a serious human presence on the moon or on Mars. And we should be thinking just as creatively as we are about these human settlements on those celestial bodies. We should be thinking just as seriously about space cities and growing our presence in orbit, whether it's orbit around the Earth or orbit around Mars for future missions. This all feels very much like um, the big moment at the beginning of commercial aviation in our, you know, directly prior century, where yes, it began with really high net worth individuals and kind of, you know, air travel itself was luxury. And it really quickly scaled uh, to become a big part of the global fabric. Um, and many, for many of us, some of, you know, travel is a part of our day-to-day -day lives now. And so we think we're at this similar cusp um, for use and access to microgravity space environments and space travel. I'll now tell you in a little bit more detail about my lab and how we make use of zero-g flights and suborbital research and ISS missions, these different platforms to prototype, design, and build what we like to say are the artifacts of our sci-fi space future. So if Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and NASA and ESA are working on the rockets to get us there, wherever there may be, Mars, Moon, or beyond. We are working on the human lived experience of space, the really rich tapestry of experiences, tools, products that will need to be designed and incorporated into future space habitats. So this image actually shows you 14 or so different images from an artist of payloads within our active program right now. Everything from small scale um, uh, 3D printing and extrusion in orbit to thinking about musical instruments that could only be played in space. We think that we have this really compelling opportunity to design new cultural artifacts for life in space rather than always taking elements of earth culture and just kind of importing them up to station, there's so much that can be designed anew with the unique affordances of microgravity. And it's an incredibly creative opportunity um, for all of us to participate in. For our flight opportunities program, every year I charter an entire zero G plane uh, for our MIT community. We bring about 25 uh, students, staff, faculty, researchers, and that usually correlates with around 15 different research projects. Um, sometimes they're free flying, sometimes they're bolted to the plane, as you can see here. These flights and how I run them are very much modeled after the NASA Flight Opportunities Program that I had an opportunity um, to go through as a student uh, years ago, an undergraduate student, and also we participated in some of the NASA grant uh, campaigns for the space, uh, space tech flights, the Ready solicitation. But at MIT, we now do our, one of our own every year, and we love to collaborate with students from outside of MIT as well. Um, so if any of you on this call are listening and have an idea for a project, but you just really need an opportunity to fly it in zero G, you should reach out to me um, and see if there might be some way to merge it in with our research portfolio. Part of our mission within this space exploration initiative that I run at MIT is to democratize access to space. And so we love being able to support collaborative projects from, you know, really all around the country and in some cases um, with some international partners as well. This is the team. I always like to show this slide because it takes a you know, really significant community to be able to pull off 40 plus projects uh, within any one year. We are highly interdisciplinary. This is really building on the spirit of the MIT Media Lab. So while my background is in physics and aerospace engineering, the Media Lab, our home department, um, is a place where you can meet artists and architects and robotics experts and data scientists and biologists. And so we've really made the space exploration initiative into a microcosm of this profoundly interdisciplinary environment. And we think that's critical because a life in space worth living will need a really richly envisioned um, set of ideas uh, and projects and research, not from any really just one discipline. And so this team here you can see is a very diverse team. I'll show you two mosaic slides that just give you kind of a sense of the breadth of our research. So we do everything from zero-g manufacturing to self-assembly. That's my passion and my PhD was in robotic self-assembling space structures for future satellite clusters or even self-assembling space habitats, bigger than the biggest rocket payload fairing. I'll talk to you a little bit more about that in a moment. Uh, to robots, VR and AR, spacesuits, 
We also work on space food. Uh, one of our researchers, Maggie Koblenz, is thinking about the use of fermentation, um, both to avoid accumulating bio waste uh, from food on station. You can ferment a lot of food waste into actually very tasty and healthy uh, gut microbiome supporting products and also increase enjoyment. Um, a big task for us at this next junction of human spaceflight is going from the purely survival mode in space, which we've been in for a long time. And we're really standing on the shoulders of giants now to be like NASA and others to be able to go from thinking about just really survival in space into thriving in space. And what does it take in terms of space food or space entertainment or musical instruments to be able to support a much broader swath of humanity to in the future be able to enjoy and derive value and participate from life in space, whether they're just going for a visit or maybe they're part of a new workforce that's working and commuting between low earth orbit and earth, or maybe they're actually there to live their life in space. Our launch pipeline for our uh, various research opportunities really begins with the zero-G flights, the Vomit Comet flights. We do at least one a year, if not more. Then a selection of projects that merit additional testing are able, we manifest them on a Blue Origin flight, typically a, a suborbital flight. Then there's the next level, which is the International Space Station. Uh, we've sent three missions, two missions so far, a third one about to go this year to the International Space Station with multiple payloads each time. Um, so we've done, um, we'll have done soon over almost over a dozen um, International Space Station individual experiments. And from there, we have our sights set on the moon. As I mentioned before, we have this upcoming lunar mission. It's actually not with the blue moon lunar lander. This is an image, a concept image from a few years ago, um, but with one of the NASA CLIPS missions happening next year. In terms of uh, turning science fiction into science fact, I wonder, I don't know this audience, but I wonder if many of you have been inspired or intrigued by science fiction through your life. It was certainly a really large part of what um, has brought me into the space exploration field. And in one of Neil Stevenson's science fiction books, Seven Eves, he depicts this future where small swarms of little robots are really living almost in symbiosis with this spacecraft that's being built, doing inspection and repair and servicing tasks. And so thanks to a NASA microgravity flight opportunity that we were able to win a grant for through tech flights, we've tested these tiny little swarm robots that you can see in the bottom pictures on four zero-g flights in this last year, including lunar gravity parabolas. We did zero-g and lunar-g. And um, one of these little robots will actually be our payload that is going to the surface of the moon on this mission that I've been alluding to with um, Intuitive Machines and Lunar Outpost. It's this tiny little robot, poorly photoshopped onto the top of their very nice looking rover. Um, and we're also planning for a, you know, kind of low gravity uh, body sensor nodes to look for water ice in a future payload. But the first payload to go will be this little, this little mobile uh, swarm robot here that you can see has mobility to move around in a low gravity environment or even in a zero G environment. And it can stay attached in a zero G environment. It stays attached um, based on magnetic wheels as long as it's running along a ferromagnetic surface. Now, most spacecraft right now are primarily aluminum body. Uh, so this magnetic attraction would not uh, work particularly well, but what we're thinking about doing is adding ferromagnetic tracks or magnetic paint to allow these robots to still service the outside of traditional spacecraft, and then we're thinking about different ways to modify the design to let them crawl and cover and do their inspection and diagnostic and servicing tasks across a wide range of in-orbit spacecraft and on the lunar surface infrastructure um, in the near future. So stay tuned to hear more about this mission. If you want to follow along with the Space Exploration Initiative, here's our Twitter and our website. Final thought about, uh, oh, I think I have a question from Secret. Go ahead. I'm sorry if you've had your hand up for a while. I just saw the Zoom window change. Oh, no, you can uh, continue and we can go to questions at the end or if you would like me to read it right now. Okay, sure. I'll keep going. I just, I saw that it uh, looks like they had their hand up, but I'm happy to take the questions now or at the end. So that's fine. Um, just another project that's less on the direct engineering side, but I think is really important for us to think about as engineers and scientists and creators of these payloads that are going to space. We need some level of po space policy and thoughtful governance for activities that are going to be taking place both in LEO in low Earth orbit and on the moon. 
And to contribute to the lunar uh, landscape, we have developed this database at MIT called LOA, it's L-O-A dot MIT dot E-D-U, where we are tracking all of the currently announced and uh, credible prospective lunar missions to be able to say, how can we deconflict some of this activity on orbit? Maybe we could, with this database, actually show areas where there's been too much investment in the same type of rover by different companies, which is really maybe a waste of resources. Could we better uh, coordinate shared approaches uh, to exploration on this low gravity body? And I think a similar, um, a similar approach could be taken with really great effect in low Earth orbit as well. It's harder to coordinate there because there are already so many actors with so many different agendas and needs and you know, research happening between Starlink satellites and the International Space Station and Tiangong. Um, but we will be entering a domain really quite soon where we need to think about space traffic management. We're already having to think about space debris and space situational awareness. And it's almost like coming to a urban planning moment for low Earth orbit. I like to say this is really urban planning at planetary scale. And so I encourage um, any of the students who are listening to this talk to reach out if you're also interested in this policy governance, uh, almost like an urban planning approach to being thoughtful space stewards as we all participate in this really exciting um, virtual new domain. In addition to the hardware engineering and the prototyping work that we do and sending payloads up to station, we really converse actively with a lot of different astronauts from all around the world. This is important to us for the uh, theory of user-centered design, user-centric research, and these are our users. Of course, now the um, panoply of people who are getting a chance to go to space is expanding, so it won't be just government agencies sending their astronauts up. Um, but we have had a real just absolute privilege to be able to work with a lot of fantastic astronauts, ask them questions about their experience for life in space and understand how their um, experience actually living uh, and working on shuttle or in the International Space Station should shape the design of the prototypes and the artifacts that we are making as scientists and engineers and designers. All of this that I talked about um, really boils down into this big ecosystem. We have 60 plus different member companies who support the MIT Media Lab, and sometimes this brings us really interesting, um, unexpected uh, input for the group. So this is, um, you know, companies, everything from Google in the past to Colgate Palmolive, um, the toothpaste company. And so it's interesting to see kind of a, an open group of companies from across the American economy begin to think about how they can participate in space as well. We collaborate really closely with NASA across a couple different fronts, uh, but also have good ties with ESA and JAXA and many different new space age companies. And this all really filters into that 40 plus in-house research project uh, portfolio. If you're interested to learn more about the breadth of these different projects, I'd say please um, take a look at our book. We just released kind of like a coffee table book in the fall that tells the story of the founding of the Space Exploration Initiative. So how I brought together the resources and the means to be able to enable a really extensive microgravity flight opportunities program like this within a university, kind of a startup within a, a larger academic environment. And then each page um, has a really high resolution photo of an interesting payload that we've sent either on a zero G flight or sent to space. And this, you know, the story behind the research team and its purpose. Um, so if you're interested to learn more, this book is available uh, through MIT Press and on Amazon. I'll now pivot to the kind of last part of the talk here, um, which I'm going to tell you about my own PhD research and how it leveraged um, various opportunities for microgravity testing. So my research passion is in spaceflight, human spaceflight, trying to enable next generation space architecture that will scale to be able to welcome more people. So right now the International Space Station is an incredible feat of engineering, but it doesn't scale particularly well, right? You can't um, dramatically add to the volume of it. And each module, uh, you know, Harmony, Destiny, Columbus, they're constrained by the size of the biggest rocket payload fairing that was available for them to fit in. And of course, constrained by other factors like energy use on orbit and, and all of that. I'm really interested in designing space structures that can be assembled in orbit or maybe expanded through origami approaches in orbit to grow much bigger 
than the biggest rocket payload fairing that we have available. And so the different types of techniques that I use in my research include modular self-assembly, so designing hardware tiles that can pack flat for their ride to orbit, be released um, either free floating in orbit or maybe contained within a membrane of some sort and encouraged to self-assemble into whatever target geometry we're aiming for. Origami, um, thinking about different methods, maybe uh, using tensegrity, all of these different kind of creative in space uh, manufacturing and construction methods. In particular, I'm gonna to talk to you guys today about Tesserae, which is a buckyball inspired habitat uh, where we have these panels that are pentagons and hexagons. And we started with this panel, basically saying, this is what space architecture currently looks like. And we really haven't been able to get away for decades, including the proposal for um, Gateway, the space station that will be in orbit around the moon up on the upper right. We haven't really been able to get away from this paradigm of architecture. And it's understandable because we tested pressure cylinders. This is a really you know, well-vetted you know, flight heritage way of keeping humans alive in orbit. But what would it take to get from this kind of small scale, somewhat modular, but not exactly reconfigurable, um, small scale space habitats to a ring world, or even to something, um, you know, like 2001 Space Odyssey, something that's like a mega structure in orbit. This is one of the challenges. If you look at this exploded view of the International Space Station, these are all of, and this is actually old, there's now, you know, new aspects of the space station that aren't even reflected here. This is how it was assembled. And even more um, keenly to point out, this is how all those parts got together. Uh, in many cases, it was uh, astronauts doing EVAs in coordination with a robotic arm. In some cases, there was a good amount of autonomous docking. But this mechanism of construction in orbit, relying on human labor on a really risky EVA in an EVA suit, this also doesn't scale particularly well. It's the old paradigm of how we build architecture on Earth, which is that there's human construction labor that's on a scaffold and building and nailing things in. Our proposal, and my research at MIT is trying to look at autonomous robotic mechanisms for assembling space structures so that we're not having to rely on um, human EVA labor as a really core part of that construction mechanism. The other aspect of my work is inspired by nature, so it's biomimetic, looking at patterns that allow us to have each modular piece contribute to a larger whole in a predictive fashion so that we can actually plan for the geometry that we're going for, but also in a way that can continue to grow and grow and grow and spiral. And so I take a lot of inspiration from uh, plants like this one that are exhibiting phyllotaxis, this interesting ordering um, of different pieces uh, within the macro structure. I'm gonna play a video now and um, talk over the sound. I did not share sound with you guys. But this is a concept video of this test ray project. So here we have a rocket leaving from Earth, the payload inside the fairing. And once we've actually achieved orbit that we're looking for around Mars, you'll see that the payload fairing opens and deploys the tide. Now, there are many different ways that we can do this deployability. This model is um, something kind of like a test. It's going to pop one tile out at a time. There are powerful magnets on the edges of each of these tiles, electro permanent magnets. That means that they're always attractive. You're not having to supply power to an electromagnet to keep them um, attractive. They're permanent magnets and apply current to and pulse them off when you need to. So that's what's allowing the tiles to just passively, in a decentralized fashion, find their neighbor and slowly, elegantly dock, flipping into place as they form this model. What we don't show in this video is sometimes the tiles come together incorrectly, and that's where the current comes in to be able to actually pulse off the magnets, separate the tiles, and allow them to have another opportunity to pull. Here we're showing the concept once one module is formed, we would love to be able to dock multiple modules into a you know, larger station. I'm gonna pause the video here because the rest of this is really kind of showing the, the inside, which is very speculative, and we might redesign this 50 times before we fly. 
but this um, video is just really the large scale concept for what we think we would be able to achieve if we can bring on this capability for microgravity in space construction and self-assembly. For those of you who are students, maybe doing your own theses or wondering how do you get um, from early stage, you know, benchtop hardware up to a vision like that, my PhD started, uh, the research deployment started with a zero G flight. So you see those three generations of hardware. Um, we actually ended up doing two or three zero G flights over the course of this project, but we started with zero G. And as we matured the tiles, miniature versions of what you see in the big artist's um, depiction, miniature versions of the tiles that have sensing and the magnets embedded and really kind of extensive state machine code to be able to handle autonomous self-assembly, diagnostic and self-disassembly as required. We're maturing the hardware incrementally flying it in periods of additional you know, duration of microgravity. So starting with the zero G flights, where you get 15 to 20 seconds per parabola, then going to suborbital where we get three minutes with Blue Origin. And then ultimately in March of 2020, we flew a 30 day International Space Station mission uh, with multiple tiles being able to really assess their dynamics over a longer time scale. And I'm thrilled to announce, although I don't have any imagery yet uh, to share, we just flew the Tesseray hardware again on the historic X1 mission um, that was just taking place over the last couple of weeks. And so we were able to actually test those Tesseray tiles in the open aisle way of the Node 2 module, the Harmony module on ISS, and watch them self-assemble and self-disassemble, handle error states, and learn more about the system as we prepare to scale up the tile size towards an ultimate human-scale habitat. In addition to all of the hardware work, it's very important for us to be able to model the expected behavior of large tiles, human scale habitat uh, tiles in orbit prior to ever doing a deployment. We need to think a lot about the control, attitude control, the time scale of assembly. How long do we anticipate that a really stochastic system like this will take to assemble its own into a habitat? And so in addition to that hardware, we paired it with a really extensive um, physics simulation, physics and mathematic mod mathematical modeling simulation to be able to predict some of the behavior at scale. I'm going to show you a snippet here of the simulation where you can see that tiles are introduced into some type of a bounding environment one at a time. While they're incorrectly bonding, they know to pulse off. Um, they know this uh, through a magnetometer and some proximity sensing. This robotic simulation allows us to layer on top of the physics engine a lot of uh, robotics control software. This was done in WeBots, uh, one of the Cyberbotics products. And what you see here is the tiles are a stochastic system, quasi-stochastic system, decentralized, finding their own way to bond with whatever neighbor is available at the time. And I love this little pentagon because you can see it continue to pulse off and pulse off and pulse off until it's finally able to self-write, flip around, and there you go. And it actually docks into place, just like a you know protein folding, trying to find the right configuration. Again, self-assembly, very much inspired by nature. I'll end uh, this segment of the talk by just saying, this is one of our visions uh, for life in orbit. This was a structure, uh, Newton's cenotaph, that was inspired or uh, in the mind of Edward Boulay in the 1800s. It's gonna be a 150 meter dome, uh, but was much larger than anything that could actually be constructed really at the time. But this is the kind of structure, something uh, elegant, monumental, really grand and inspiring that we have an unusual opportunity to build in orbit because of the absence of gravity. Or not, as we should all say, for not the absence of gravity, but microgravity, um, because we're actually able to self-assemble large and, and kind of more expansive structures. So this is one of our guiding lights, thinking about the future of what space architecture might be able to look like in the future. I'll just end the talk now with a few kind of philosophical thoughts about this new era that we're all entering into together. I think many people will recognize the term Anthropocene, which is now used to describe the era of the earth where humans really came to have a dominant effect for better and for worse. We have just coined this term at MIT called the Anthropocosmos, 
the idea here is that we humans are about to have a really expanding role in the near neighborhood of our, of our solar system, expanding out into the cosmos. And what are the opportunities, but also the responsibilities to being good space stewards as we go out into this domain? We're already seeing tragedies of the commons like space debris, and we need to think ahead before we um, rush into all kinds of different interesting scenarios about the potential long-term impacts of our actions, and then also the amazing opportunities and how we would want to design um, the future of interplanetary civilization. This is a beautiful, you know, stunning rendition of the famous Earthrise photo uh, taken by Bill Anders, and something that I try to make sure that our team honors in our work is the spirit of exploration, but not exploration for the sake of abandoning. This notion of um, being good stewards of the space commons and that beautiful photo from uh, the Apollo 8 mission reminding us that part of what we, part of what we can experience as humans when we do take these steps to voyage out further is a better appreciation for our own planet in addition to the act of exploring and learning more about what's beyond Earth. And so in that spirit, I am spinning out a new startup uh, out of my lab from the MIT Media Lab, and we are fashioning it around this concept of what would a real life Starfleet Academy look like at this inflection point with all of this exciting activity in space and in the you know real um, well real it's science fiction but to many of us it feels very real this uh, Star Trek vision of Starfleet Academy was also where the technology of the Enterprise was built and so this new startup that I just founded is called Aurelia and we are working on next generation space architecture so things that will look very different than the International Space Station things that will be able to spin in orbit and provide artificial gravity or larger scale self-assembling modular space architecture. And through this organization, we'll also do quite a bit of education and outreach and take the flight opportunities program that I've just described that we do at MIT and try to democratize access to it well beyond um, just MIT and even beyond academia. We're actually gonna have a very open opportunity for people to join research zero G flights, not just space tourism, but actually really participating in building the hands-on artifacts and this next generation of technologies for life in space. Thank you so much, Dr. Will, for your amazing talk. Um, unfortunately, because we got cut off, the questions that we had are kind of, um, we don't have access to them at the moment, but they were recorded. Um, if anyone would like to jump in and just ask the questions, um, just unmute yourself and ask the questions directly, feel free to do that. Um, or you could type it in the chat and I'll um, read it as well. Hi, Doctor, I have a question. And I'm, I'm from Puerto Rico. For the last two years I've been developing and searching the, all the federal help that there is to make a proposal for a enterprise in Puerto Rico from which um, I'm aiming to do the construction for the Artemis program and to do research and development on, on technologies. But uh, I'm gonna be using the money that has been granted for the bipartisan agreement for the restoration of the nation, and uh, also the zero emissions. I am a constructor, FEMA inspector, also ocean inspector between other stuff and on agriculture. And then I've been doing a micro macro enterprise to use Puerto Rico and all this jurisdiction with the help of the money that came with the federal government from the Hurricane Irma and Maria to do to start doing now the construction for thinking about the climate climate change and global warming. And so I can develop all this technology to build and to make the equipment for zero G. I would like to get in contact with you and your company. I'm not a student, I am uh, I'm autodidacting, I, I got neurodiversity. I never finished my university, but I'm certifying a whole bunch of other stuff. And I've been in contact with 10 universities that we have in Puerto Rico that they have interest in to be part of this enterprise that I'm making. So I would like to send you my idea to see if we can do something together in the future. From the image that you show in here, which one should I use to get in contact with you? You can use the hello at aureliainstitute.org. And forgive us if we're a little slow to get back to you because we're just launching. Um, so we'll end up kind of um, 
maybe taking a little bit more time than I usually would to reply to emails, but you can send us your thoughts there. And thank you so much for the great work that you're doing. You're welcome, man. Thank you. Sigrid, I think we have several several questions for you. Would you like to, to ask them now? Well, I was hoping that the students would ask theirs first. So any students, let them go ahead and... Uh, hello, uh, my name is Dominique. I'm from Jamaica. So you were talking about like um, policies, like space policies. Um, I'm not like a space lawyer because we don't really have like a space in the industry out here. But um, in terms of like your new companies and stuff, I was thinking because the space sector has been like sending more like payloads into the into space and stuff and when you read you see that um more people like elon musk have been having um defects and they've been like burning up into the atmosphere my question was would mit be interested in like starting a project of like a recycling space technology projects so like if you know that the um the spacecraft or like any any um device that you have in space is going faulty or bad would you like guys like try to find or build a technology that can actually like collect the space debris or um space junk before it like burns up into the atmosphere because i was like if you, if you spend this x amount of money building it right and then something goes wrong it kind of is a waste to just burn up into the atmosphere and then like increase that you know the mm -hmm. um the whole carbon emissions over time and then you're going to cost the whole you know the earth going through um climate change and everything so i was thinking if we had like a well not a garbage truck but like a you know a kind mm -hmm. of truck collecting collect, yeah a recycling collection in space then i think you know we could like still manage the space wisely and then we can use we can like get the um the materials from space to earth and then just use them in like new innovations so mm -hmm. i was wondering like if that's a project you guys would be like interested in i think it's a, a very worthy uh concept there are a few different groups who are working on something similar i would say to my knowledge i don't think an mit faculty or pi is yet working in that exact area in terms of recycling but NanoRax is very keen to recycle spent fuel rocket stages in orbit and turn these hollow volumes into something like an agricultural growing station. Uh, Astroscale is a company that's very actively looking at the space debris problem and how they can gather up space debris. I suspect that they have some interest or have considered if they get an asset that's actually worthy of maybe repairing or reusing as opposed to just uh, gathering up in a large mass um, for incineration upon reentry, um, they may have a project along the lines of what you're thinking about. So I think it's a, a very interesting question, definitely something that um, is worth exploring. MIT, for research collaboration, it would typically tend to be something a little bit more on the hypothesis side. So if there was a science question or an engineering question we were trying to answer through doing a project, that would be the basis of a, of a collaboration. But I think it's a, a great idea. And I would just point you to Astroscale um, in particular and NanoRax for their approaches to that thus far. And maybe there's a way for you to get involved with them as well. And I think That's I have time so for, sorry, I think I have time for just one more question then I have to run a little bit early this afternoon, but thank you so much to everybody who came to, came to talk. Well, I'll ask, I actually have two questions. One, one was about the little wheels, the magnetic wheels that you have and the fact that there's metallic substances in, you know, particles and regolith. Won't those also just get attracted to the wheels and then clog up your mechanism for roll, you know, Maneuvering. Um, I know that you're planning to do it on surfaces of, of vehicles, but how, I mean, it seems like that would be one issue. So the other issue is, since you're in, in engineering, you know, two of the big biggest problems for biological experiments on the lunar surface are late load and then mm -hmm. sample return. Yes. Um, so so it just seems like it would be really great to have you know kind of a common common modular way of doing experiments that at least, I mean, the, one of the main common modules for sample return would be a sample return module that could then mm -hmm. be collected, like, 
like the Mars, like the Mars, you know, rover picks up, you know, is collecting all the different uh, Mars samples for later right. return. Right. So right. do you know of any um, plans to develop something like that that would be really critical for not just biological experiments, but any, any, you know, any sampling experiments? Interesting. That is a fantastic point. I couldn't agree more that I think we need some type of a modular uh, interoperable system that would be able to go back up and pick up samples. For our mission, we are not expecting to be able to have anything in terms of a sample return opportunity, although we would love to collect the little astro ant afterwards and assess how its wheels behaved and how they were gummed up, not just because of the nature of the, you know, the material science of the regolith, but also because it's so sharp. Um, yeah. And they also have the ESD concerns about it just being attracted with the static. Um, so we are expecting quite a lot of trouble with the wheels, but part of this is a question of how, how long will they operate for? We expect the rover, the vehicle that they're on to kick up some dust. And part of the experiment is saying, how long will they be able to um, still process in that environment? We have a couple different mitigating um, technologies that we're gonna try out with the wheels. Um, but I don't know of any proposals yet in terms of modular, designs or like a standard interface for sample return, but I think that's a fantastic, I think that's a fantastic idea. Um, our main challenge when we were deciding whether to do a bio experiment with this first lunar mission opportunity as opposed to a robotics experiment, in addition to late load, as you identified, um, it's also just the thermal extremes that we're expecting to see and how to really insulate it against that effectively. Um, we have in the past for ISS, we've actually learned a lot from BioServe out of the uh, CU Boulder community. I was talking to Alvaro about them before and Space Tango, but I have not yet seen, you know, a good company or a series of concepts kind of arise to standardize bio payloads for the moon, but would love so you, to. You might look at, you know, the, the BioSentinel project because they're, you know, BioSentinel? that's the deep space biological experiment. Um, and they're also doing analogous experiments on ISS and the moon. So they'll be they'll be sending basically the same experiment okay. in all three places. And so they're, um, they're th basically it's using yeast. So the okay. yeast are basically, if they can keep things at like five degrees, um, that's, you know, that's kind of their um, nominal temperature, but then when they want to, then they can activate different modules. And each of those modules mm -hmm. has a little thermal unit for, um, you know, for being able to introduce media into the cultures okay. and, and then actually do uh, do colorimetric and um, photometric assays. Fantastic, BioSentinel. Okay, I will take a peek. Thank you. Thank you. I'll put. Let me. I'll put a link in the chat if I give me a second. Great. And um, with that, I'm afraid I'm going to have to drop off this afternoon. But thank you again, and looking forward to staying in touch with the ASGSR community in different ways. Thanks again for pulling me in, folks. Have a nice afternoon. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It has been a real pleasure. And best of thank luck you. with your next parabolic experiments. Thank you. Thank you. Talk soon. Bye-bye.